Well, thanks for joining us for the fall update for the 2024 crop year. Uh, this is Corey. I'm with KW Insurance here. Just really quickly, if you're not with our agency and you would like a place that really could do a good job of servicing your crop insurance policy, really values education and accuracy, just contact us at KW Insurance and Sunburst and we would be happy um, to at least run through your policy with you and, and kind of show you the direction that we would take it. So, so to get started here on the claims updates and reminders, one thing that changed in our office that's a, a positive thing here is we were now, now able to print claim checks at our office through NAU. So once your claim's finalized at the office in Missoula, that same day, we can crank out claims checks and get them right to you guys. So that, that will speed up your claim payments substantially, especially if it happens to hit on a weekend or something where you have to wait several more days. Um, with interest at 10% on some of these operating notes, the quicker we can get you cash, the better on this stuff. Um, call us if your claim isn't going well or if you have questions, we're always here to help. Per the conflict of interest rules, we're not allowed to be in the same room with you and the adjuster, but we can help answer questions on your policy or address any issues that you might be having. Um, it could be something as simple as, hey, my adjuster hasn't contacted me in a couple weeks. We want to know that stuff so that we can push this stuff along. So, so please let us know if you're having any issues with your claims. Um, ACH, so direct deposit, is also an option for lost payments. So if you'd like to set that up, just uh, let us know and we'll, we'll get a voided check from you and we can have stuff direct deposited into your bank account. Make sure you have bin samples submitted for each bin. If you think there's even a remote chance you could have quality issues, there's so many ways that that $30 cost of the sample to send it to the state could make you thousands of dollars on a, a bin of grain. And that, that could come from um, dockage that's not getting recognized when we just do bin measurements, which is very possible. Even something as simple as test weight, which the adjusters should be doing with test weight cups out there. If you've got 44 pound barley instead of 48, that's roughly, let's say, a 10% difference in the test weight on a thousand bushel bin. That could be a, the difference of a thousand, or on a 10,000 bushel bin, that could be a thousand bushels difference in your claim. So just if you're going to have claims settled in the bin, there's no reason not to send that stuff off to the state. It gives you guys a good idea what you have to market anyways, and we can capture stuff like uh, dockage and, and things that wouldn't have got caught otherwise. So, so anyways, with all these claims this year, especially with a lot of light test weights, make sure you get stuff sent off to the state. The adjuster will do it for you. Just make sure you let them know. And always make sure you have an accurate test weight. If you don't want to go through the expense of the sampling, at least make sure... If you're out there when they're working the claim that they use the test weight cup and get the actual test weight of your grain and don't just plug in standard test weight. So October 31st is the end of the insurance period for most crops. Um, we're getting close to October now. So if you have some stuff sitting out there, like our flax is super green um, and it doesn't look like you're going to get it cut by October 31st, you need to let us know so we can have an adjuster go out there and appraise that production on, on or before that date, basically. There's some other important dates. Uh, one of the what we're looking at now obviously is the winter wheat seeding date there is no earliest planting date for winter wheat but there is a late planting date for most counties in montana of november 15th that's pretty late obviously most of you guys here would never seed winter wheat that late but the other date that doesn't show up on this chart that we're looking at here is the date in which you cut off the winter option so if you don't seed that winter wheat by october 30th even though we're not to the late plant date on winter wheat, you don't get to use the winter option anymore, even if that's on your policy. So, so like we said, what does that pertain to is looking at this picture here. This is our flax from just a week ago. It was ready to cut because we're in a horrible drought here. We actually got a fluke kind of couple inches of rain in August. And that stuff went from nearly mature to turned around and now is flowering again. So if you guys have crops like this, this is where we're going to be concerned about that October 30th um, cutoff date. For the end of the insurance so 2023 this year in review um better than 22 for most of you guys but still below average in a lot of areas uh specifically like where our farm's at here in northern tool county we only had a couple inches of rain for the whole growing season so we are kind of average or slightly below average on the pulse crops and then quite a ways below on the barley and the spring wheat any of the spring crops um, we'll go through your SEO and ECO estimates and kind of what we think is going to happen with those paying, um, at least in the counties surrounding us. There's going to be some revenue claims possible too because the price has dropped as much as like 20% on the barley and 10 plus percent on winter wheat. So 
It might be that you guys thought, well, I'm right on the edge of my guarantee, but now when we figure the revenue part in there, you very well could have a claim. Your premium payments aren't due till November 30th as part of this drought relief package that the government came out with. It seems like we're stuck in a perpetual cycle now where really your payments aren't due till November 30th. First it was COVID and then there was droughts everywhere. And as far as I can tell, unless something changes going forward, you're going to get billed like normal. It's hard to see on your bill that it's not due, um, but you're not actually going to get charged any interest or have any issues until November 30th on your policies if you don't pay for those. There is some exceptions on stuff like forage, I believe, is due earlier than that. Um, so don't miss those payments. But the stuff that's normally billed August 15th, which would be most of your small grain crops and the pulses, those now aren't due till November 30th. Now, that being said, you need to pay that payment by November 30th or we would actually go into a cancellation situation on your winter wheat. You wouldn't have insurance on the winter wheat. We'd have to reappraise it in the spring. So don't pay your premium yet. Hopefully your claims will finish it up if you have claims. If not, make sure if you wait till the end of November, you pay that either online so you, you get a confirmation because we don't want these checks getting lost in the mail um, or you call the company and they can do an ACH usually for you on that. So here's the current drought map for Montana. Um, well, things were pretty good down Great Falls and South. Now when you look Great Falls North on this map here, um, it's been quite some time since we've had enough rain really to get us back to where we're back ahead again. So pretty bad drought from about Great Falls. We're now abnormally dry. When you get just north of there, we're now into a D2 drought. And we're, when you get up by us, so Northern Toole County, Glacier County, um, even parts of Hill, Liberty, um, counties all along the Highline are now in a D3 drought. So there's only one level higher than we can go from that. Now, the positive thing on this is if you hit a D3 drought, that triggers a lot of those USDA programs to open up through the FSA and the NRCS um, there. So now we've got livestock forage disaster programs that have opened up through the FSA. There's ELAP. There's a bunch of other programs like um, ERP if it was to trigger again or if it was going to be approved again for 23. We now qualify for that for sure. So, so while it's depressing to be in a D3 drought, which we are, if it's going to be dry, we want it to be dry enough to trigger those disaster programs. So um, what will we review here? The base price is set now for winter wheat. It's at 741, which is down from 877 a bushel last year. So your winter wheat guarantees have rolled back. Um, 15 to 20% for the prior year. That means your premium has as well, but we would rather have the higher guarantees usually, right? Um, the malt barley endorsement, there's lots of claims this year on barley quality. If your agent hasn't reviewed the malt barley endorsement with you, most of them looked at it when it changed, when the rules changed and said it wasn't worth it anymore. I am total disagreement with that. There's been multiple times this still has paid way more than what you guys have paid an extra premium into this. Um, I did have a guy ask me if we can do optional units of malt, in the malt endorsement, an irrigated guy, and yes, you can. That seems to be another misassumption is that there's no optional units that are available in that program either. So if you're a malt guy and you're mostly worried about having quality issues and losing that value, it's well worth the money to be in that program, especially if you're an enterprise unit because it's not a huge amount more money. So. Um, SEO for 23, I think, is likely to pay in some of these counties, and I'll show you why. Enterprise units by type was a big change. That's a positive thing. And then um, we'll go through like your PLC and your ARC loss estimates for the FSA and the 60-day extension, once again, to pay your premium due to drought. The PRF sales closing date is coming up December 1st. If you guys want to get in on that program, obviously December 1st is a deadline for that and that would allow you to insure your grass if we have a limited rainfall situation in the months that you pick or any grass alfalfa mix or straight alfalfa hay. So the one thing with the grass end of it is you have to actually have ownership in cattle to insure the grass, but there's no linkage requirement like that for the hay ground. So. Talk to your agent before December 1st if you're interested in the, the rainfall insurance end of things too. Um, there's a farmer, por farmer portal available through NAU. I would really encourage you guys to go on and sign up for this. All you need is your policy number, so off your statement or your uh, um, crop insurance documents that we send you. And then I think the last four of your tax ID number, you can create a login. And once you get in there, we can do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, at our 
in person meetings. I went through this step by step. I'm not going to do this here because I'm sure you guys are probably on a tractor or something and won't watch anyways. But create a, a login through the farmer portal. You go to naucountry.com, click farmer portal. It'll show you your premiums. There's things we can do like um, all sorts of data you can look at in the fields because we know your plant dates off of that or to predict when your harvest dates are going to be. Um, you can look when hailstorms come through and where the worst of a hailstorm hit to scout on your farm through the easy weather portion of this. But in general, just creating this login will open up a whole series of uh, cool free data things that you can do on your farm. So I'd play around in that. You can use it on your cell phone or on the computer. It works equally as well either way. One thing that changed this year for 23 is we now have something called same year production reporting. Normally, your production from like this last crop year would be the first thing we do in the 2024 crop year. Well, now there's going to be two times when we potentially might have to report production. If we change things like your unit structure, landowners change something like that on your farm, we actually may have two production reports for you to sign. I'm not going to explain any more of this because it's more the agent needs to know it, not you side of thing. But if you have to sign two production reports, that is why. So... Beginning Farmer Rancher, just real quick review. If you have less than five years of experience of income in uh, farming, which could include getting income from cattle or whatever. If you have less than five years, and we can exclude years when you're under 18, in active duty in the military or gone to college. So if your son or daughter, you made part of the farm operation through high school, and then they went to college, and now they're just coming back and want to get rolling on the farm, even if they had farm income through those um, years when they were in school and stuff, we can exclude those and they'd still qualify. The one thing you don't want to do is just put your son or daughter, once they're out of college or out of high school, just put them on the farm and pay them a little bit of money every year so that they're getting Schedule F income because you're taking away from these years that they would qualify for this beginning farmer thing. So um, the other thing is that you don't want to roll them right into an operation that you're already operating. So if you just make them part of your corporation, Everybody on that corporation has to qualify to get this beginning farmer rancher benefit. You'd be better off starting an LLC or something for the child to come in there and start their own entity up because it's a pretty substantial discount. Um, on enterprise units, you're already subsidized at 80%. This adds another 10 points of premium subsidy. So that takes them up to 90% subsidy that the government would take care of on this program. Basically cuts your enterprise unit premium in half. So it could be a pretty big deal for about five years in this program. Uh, native sod breaking. Basically, the long and short of this is do not do this without talking to the FSA. This could be something as simple as a five acre fence line that you took out that's labeled as sod on their maps. If it is native sod and you break it out and you don't have a plan set up at the FSA, it could disqualify you for all of these programs. So on our end, the first year you see it, you can either do a written agreement to get it insured or just seed it and not have insurance on it. And then the next four years of it was actually truly native sod. You'll end up getting a reduction in your coverage and a reduction in the premium subsidy for four years till we get to four insurable crops on there. So talk to the FSA if you're doing any new breaking. CRP breaking. Um, there's a lot of this stuff coming out of these programs. If it's coming out of a USDA program, whether it's um, CRP or an EQIP contract that had it in grass, those sorts of things qualify for this exemption. You have to seed it within two years of it coming out of the program to get 100% of the county average. So otherwise it becomes new breaking. So here's just a quick example. Let's say the CRP came out in the fall of 2019. So if it comes out in the fall of any year, that's actually the start of the next crop year. So the fall of 2019 would be the start of the 2020 crop year, just like if you'd seeded winter wheat. So then you have the spring of 2020. So we've got to either seed it in the 2020 or 2021 crop year, right? So we'd have the fall of 19, spring of 20, fall of 20, and then the spring of 21. Where people get screwed up here is when you get to the fall of 21, that's actually the start of the 2022 crop year. And uh, if you were just to go backwards in years, you'd think, well, I had 20 and 21 to get this seeded in. Well, the fall of 21 is actually 22 as far as the insurance looks at it. So long story short, be careful when you take stuff out of a USDA program. If you're taking over a lease that was in CRP, don't trust the landlord when they say, oh, I think it came out 
in the fall of 2019. What's happened oftentimes here is that people just take the landlord's guess for it, then they go start break it out and start farming it. It turns out that it's new breaking. It's not coming out of CRP. Worst case scenario in that example would be with CRP, you could actually break it out in the spring and seed it in the spring. If it becomes new breaking because it's been out of the program too long, you can't break it in the spring and seed it in the spring and have it be insurable. It has to have been broken out by, I think, November 15th of the previous fall. So there's different rules anyways if it comes out of this CRP program versus being new breaking. And some of those rules would actually make this stuff uninsurable, just so you guys know. So CRP out after two crop years becomes new breaking. It's just like breaking out an old hay field requires a written agreement so we need to know that on our end before this deadline if it's for winter wheat or before march 15th for all the spring crops if we miss that deadline it's very possible this won't be insured it must be done at least we need to look at it before the deadlines because if it gets over so many acres we can't do them in-house so added land um, if you get over 2,000 acres you're basically stuck with the county average unless you do a share lease with the person that you're adding the land with. If it is um, under 2,000 acres, then we get to use the simple average of all the rest of your units. Or So if you have better yields on your farm established than the county average, we can use a simple average of all your other units of the same crop and type. Um, otherwise, if you get over 2,000 acres and you just go buy that land and uh, it's a, or it's a cash lease, let's say, then you're stuck with the county average on that land going forward. We can't simple average that for the rest of your units, which can be a pretty big deal for some of you guys. Now, the winter option, you always want to take this. It costs 10% more on winter wheat, but it gives you three options if the winter wheat fails. So if you don't have WO on your app when you look at it here, that means you don't have the winter option if you don't have that next to the wheat. If you take the winter option, it gives us three options. So we can get a replant payment, and seed to spring wheat. We can destroy the winter wheat and take your money, then reseed to any other crop um, and have it not insured. And that's the most popular way to do this because if your winter wheat has totally failed on a unit, and a, when I say unit, it could be, if you're an enterprise unit, the whole farm would have to fail for this to work. But if we get a bad enough appraisal on your winter wheat that you want to just zero it out, then it leaves you with options of you could fallow it and still have got all the money out of the winter wheat. You could seed it to spring wheat or peas or barley, any crop that you want at that point. Take all the winter wheat money from the crop insurance. And then if that next crop, the spring crop, does well, then that's the one way you can kind of get double income on this land. Um, with the old winter option, remember, you could get paid 100% on spring and winter wheat. We can't do that anymore. They'll pay you if you want to insure the second crop. So in this example, we say, okay, we want to go ahead and insure the spring wheat too. You'd take 35% of your winter wheat loss up front. So they'll only pay you 35% of that winter wheat being zeroed out. Then you'd insure the spring wheat, but the max payout we could get between the spring and the winter wheat would be 135%. So if the spring wheat doesn't have a loss, they'll go back and pay you the rest of the winter wheat loss, but then we have double premium that is due on that. If you don't elect this and are forced to seed spring wheat, if you don't elect this, you're forced to seed spring wheat and take the replant payment. So that's the big thing. If you don't have a winter option and you get into the spring and it's super dry like it is now and you want to just fallow that or something, you have no choice but to recede that to spring wheat if, uh, if you don't take the winter option, basically. You must seed it by October 31st. That is uh, the deadline for the winter option portion. Remember on that previous slide, we showed you you have till November 15th technically to seed winter wheat, but not to still have the winter option apply. That is just kind of a funny slide. It says you seeded 10,000 acres in the final plant date. I'm not even mad. That's amazing. So if you get to where you're getting into a late plant period, oftentimes you would see on a, a grower's maps where he marked everything May 31st or something. Um, obviously that's a red flag that perhaps you're doing something fraudulent. So make sure you ac ac mark accurate plant dates on your maps. But I thought that was pretty funny anyways from the stuff we see here. Triticale or Triticale, however you guys want to say that, is insurable in most of our counties. It is not in Hill County, in east of Hill County, I think, possibly. But along the High Line here, Glacier Tool, Ponderay, Liberty, I believe all of those counties, we can now insure Triticale in. 
there are fall and or winter and spring types that are insurable. You must be seeded with the intent to use for grain. So if it doesn't mean you can't graze this if that's what you guys end up with wanting to do for the end use of it in the spring, but on your maps, it needs to be marked that you're intending to seed this for grain, and then we can insure it that way. You start with a 557 a bushel base price on the winter type, and we can then use a production contract. So if a feedlot would give you a contract for this to buy it back for feed, or a seed company would buy it back for seed, we can use the contract as long as it covers all your production to increase your coverage up to 1264 a bushel. So this is different than regular wheat. We can actually take a contract and apply it to increase the value that we're insuring. It doesn't have revenue protection, so there's not a spring and a fall price figured, but it does have contract pricing, which is pretty cool, even on conventional. So it also starts with some pretty high yields. So 38 bushels an acre on summer follow in map area two in Toole County, which is actually the average map area for the county, not the high one. You'd start with 25 bushels an acre recrop yield um, on Triticale in this county. And then 48 bushel summer follow and 39 recrop in the best area of Toole County. So potentially some rather large coverage uh, amounts, like uh, large guarantees on this crop if you can get a decent contract. Um, and actually are in a, a good map area here. So something worth looking at anyways is the wheat prices keep getting more depressed. Also, if you're going to just seed triticale anyways, you might as well seed it with the intent to take it to grain. And then if it ends up failing, then you'd potentially get a loss payment here in the crop insurance. If you end up wanting to hay it instead, then we can just come out and appraise it. We'll assign so many bushels to it off your appraisal. And then that's what we'd use for your loss payment. And you could hay it or graze it or destroy it if you want. Enterprise units by type was a very, very positive change in 22. That basically allowed us to split, split winter wheat, spring wheat, and durum all into separate enterprise units by type. Before, if you were an enterprise units, it would have thrown all three of these together. Same thing for peas, chickpeas, and lentils. The same premium as before as far as discounts go, but the big thing is you need to make sure you seed two sections of 20 or more acres of each type now to make this work. So. Before we just had to see two sections of wheat because it was going to get thrown together anyways of any type. Now we need to have two sections of 20 or more acres of winter wheat. And then if you do spring wheat, the same thing. And then if durum, the same thing, right? And the same thing on the peas, the chickpeas, and the lentils. Otherwise, this is going to revert back to being an optional unit on the one that you didn't do it correctly on or get thrown together. So just quick example here, we got 100 acres of winter wheat in section one, 40 acres in section two. We did good there, right? We got the enterprise unit discount on the winter wheat. What happens oftentimes is we get to the spring and forget about this and see just one section of spring wheat to 200 acres of spring wheat. In this example, that spring wheat would either have to be put in its own optional units and you'd pay the higher premium amount or it would get combined together with the winter wheat and get the discount, which isn't desirable either. So. This next slide just shows why this is so important. This is a comparison of this year's winter wheat quote on like a 30 bushel average summer fall of winter wheat tool county unit, I think. So um, for that unit, $11.69 in optional units and $4.36 in enterprise. So a third the premium to be in enterprise units versus optional. It could be that you only have two sections of winter wheat like in that previous example. If you didn't switch your wheat from optional to enterprise units, those two sections might even be in the same field, but you would pay that much more premium for the same coverage in that example there. So really important to know what your seating plan is. I really encourage people to just be in enterprise units on everything that they can be in. Stack the county programs on top of that. It may not work out every year where that's the best paying thing, but long term, certainly through our experience here, that's worked out to be the best. So. So quick example on a malt barley endorsement loss. This is a simplified version of how this will work, but it's 90% accurate anyways. There's some other variables in there, but basically we've got 10,000 bushels of barley that we cut. We're gonna say that that 10,000 bushels is already below our guarantee for this example anyways, but um, the 10,000 bushels of barley that we harvested has been all rejected. So the feed price that we're gonna get for that barley is four bucks a bushel. They now use local market pricing for this program. The contracted price would have been $8 a bushel for this same stuff. So what they're gonna do is divide the feed price you got into the malt price you should have had if it would have made your contract. 
Um, and then for this example, four into eight is 50%. So they're gonna only count 50% of your bushels for the claim. Because we're in revenue protection on the barley, you can be in revenue protection in the malt endorsement at the same time. That's another thing that really screws people up is a lot of these agents will put you guys into yield protection because you can use the contract price to increase the value of your barley and yield protection. That screws up so many things between like this year where the, the price dropped 20%, you don't get to use that on the yield protection side of the insurance. The revenue protection would have probably, if you're right on the edge of a claim, will put you into a claim. You wouldn't have a claim if you were in YP. Plus, you wouldn't get this 5,000 bushel reduction in this example because you're now in the malt endorsement as well. So I would really encourage you to look hard at switching to the malt endorsement and being in revenue protection if you're not. So because we're in revenue protection, not only do we get the reduction in the bushels because it didn't make malt, they also track a futures market on this and they're gonna drop our production 20 more percent because the barley price went down 20% this year. So that in essence takes another thousand bushels off your claim. So now your 10,000 bushels that's sitting in the bin only gets counted as 4,000 bushels for the claim scenario. So that's where your big loss payments come in in this program. Lots of barley that got rejected this year because of thins, um, test weight, just lots of things that worked against it because it didn't rain later in the summer. So this can be a pretty big deal. The prices are set for winter wheat. Looking at this slide, I've got 2022's price that was set at 710 a bushel. Um, then last year we got up to 877 a bushel and now we've rolled back to 740 for a starting price for your winter wheat, like we talked about at the beginning. So the wheat market, as you can see on this slide, we had hit a pretty good peak in there. This is a 40 or 50 year chart of the wheat market. Um, you can see every time we get close to a recession, that's these gray bars in here, the wheat market falls off. We talked about this last fall and basically what we were predicting what happened has started to happen where the wheat market had kind of hit a peak and is starting to fall apart. If you look at trend lines on there, there's actually room for it to go down even farther. That makes it all the more important to be in revenue protection. It also makes it easier for these county programs like SCO and ECO to trigger, even if we have a relatively decent year in the county. So this is just my opinion. I'm obviously not a great marketing expert, but there's certainly room for this to roll back some more here. If not, let's say that something happens in Ukraine, the price doubles on wheat. Um, and you have a drought next year, like we're in a D3 drought already, if that market were to move way up as well, you would get double payments on not only your underlying policy, but the county-based ECO and SCO in that scenario as well. But for now, because of the higher interest rates, the general um, risk that we're gonna hit a recession because of that, I think there's a reasonably decent chance the wheat market might roll back a little bit more here. And this is just a premium comparison to last year. Basically, it's down about 15 to 20% on the premium end and then down 15 to 20% on your coverage end, which we already knew. So here are the um, projected or what are we usually call base prices and the harvest prices of all the commodities for this last crop year. So winter wheat started at 877 a bushel, ended up down at 752 a bushel for the August future when we, when we track the futures in August. So we're down 14% on winter wheat. 10% on spring wheat in Durham. That basically means you can cut that percentage more bushel wise and still have a loss payment above what your initial guarantee was. So it's very possible if some of you guys were right on the edge of claims, you very well now be into a decent size claim just because of the revenue drops. Barley is a really big one. Barley dropped 21% as well as oats. So those that makes not only your individual loss payments much more likely to pay because it increases your guarantee that much, but the county-based programs that they just have shallow losses like ECO needs to be below 95% of average for the county, that makes that a shoe in to pay like in our county where we're already at depressed yields. So big deal when these prices drop. It makes things much more likely to pay. This is just a real quick example of what happens when the price goes up with revenue protection on your crop insurance. So for this example, we're going to say you started at five bucks a bushel on 30 bushel guarantee on wheat. So you had $150 an acre guarantee. You only cut 10 bushels an acre. So this was kind of like the last several years here in Tool County. But the futures market increased to $10 a bushel. 
the guarantee increases to $10 a bushel times the 30 bushel guarantee that you had. So now your guarantee went up from 150 bucks an acre to 300. In other words, if we got zeroed out in this unit, you can now get $300. That's how the insurance works. You have 10 bushels of production that you can now haul to the elevator to sell, hopefully for that higher price. They don't care what you sell the production for on this revenue stuff. So on your claim, your 10 bushels that you harvested is valued at 10 bucks a bushel or $100 an acre. You're 20 bushels short below your 30 bushel guarantee. You remember we only cut 10 bushels here. So the 20 bushels you're short is now paid out at 10 bucks. So you have a $200 an acre loss payment in this scenario. Uh, and you cut a 10 bushel crop. So that's where, actually in 21, I believe this, this scenario happened where the revenue prices almost doubled from where we started and we all got substantially larger payments because of that. Now, rolling into this year, we're in a different scenario where the price went down at harvest, right? So let's say your base price starts at 10 bucks a bushel times your 30 bushel guarantee. So $300 an acre guarantee. We actually go out and we harvest 30 bushels an acre. So right up front, before we figure any harvest price stuff, we say, we don't have a loss here. We cut right at our guarantee, right? But at harvest, the price went down to five bucks a bushel. That's the... And during the month of August, they averaged the futures markets for all these commodities. And that's where that harvest price comes from. Your 30 bu there are 30 bushels that you cut that was right at your bushel guarantee. Now is only at valued at $5 a bushel for the insurance. So you only cut $150 an acre worth of crop as far as the insurance looks at it. So our guarantee is 300 bucks an acre. That never goes below that, even if the price goes down at harvest on the insurance. Um, but we only cut $150 worth of value, even though we cut a 30 bushel crop. So we have $150 an acre loss payment in this scenario. So that, this is two examples that show you how important being in that RP side of the insurance is. So what does that mean for ECO and SEO, those county-based programs, which we have had nothing but good luck with here, at least through our agency? That means that these are very likely to pay if you're in a scenario where the county was at average or slightly below, which we're at a slightly below average situation in Toole County here. So this is the actual average for wheat in Toole County is 36 bushels an acre for these programs. We're gonna say we start at nine, nine bucks a bushel, which is pretty darn close to where we started. So $324 of expected revenue for wheat in Toole County. The grain market now declines to seven bucks a bushel, which is basically what happened, right? So we're going to say that we cut a 38 bushel average for Toole County. So we're two bushels above our average yield. Obviously this year we're actually below. I would guess the average yield for wheat in Toole County is going to end up closer to 30. So we, when we get into our predictions on these programs, I think it's definitely going to pay here. But in this scenario, we cut a kind of a bumper crop or a pretty good crop for the county. We cut a 38 bushel average crop for wheat in the county, but the price went to seven bucks. That means we only cut... 38, we cut 38 bushels times $7 a bushel, which is $266 an acre of value in the county. We were expecting 324. That means when we divide 266 into 324, we only got 82% of what our expected value was for the county. So if you're in ECO and SEO, ECO starts to trigger at 95% and pays all out at 86%. So we would get all of our ECO money and then your SEO starts to trigger at 86% of, of value for the county and pays all the way out when you get to your individual crop insurance level, which in our scenario for most of our customers would be 75%. So would we get all of our SEO money in this scenario? We wouldn't, but we would get pretty close to half of it because we're about halfway down to that 75% um, crop insurance level. So you can see where you can even cut pretty good crops and with revenue fluctuating in these county programs, you can still get pretty big payments. So how does ECO and SEO work? Just for you guys that aren't familiar with this, you pick your individual crop insurance level and then SEO covers you from that level that you pick. So for most of our guys at 75%, it would cover you then up to 86% on SEO. And then if you pick ECO, which is more expensive because it's more likely to pay, you get paid all the way up to 95% of your average in all your units if we have a disaster year. So how is that paid through our agency? Um, in 2015, that was the first year we could do it. And really wheat was the only thing available. There was a little bit paid in there of $89,000 in premium. 
and five hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars in payout. So you can see over five times what was paid in was paid out. And this trend continued. We hit some very volatile market years in here where wheat really got depressed, and we've had sustained droughts in this county, anyways. So it paid every year then from 2015 all the way up through 2019. The only year it didn't pay more than what was paid in in premium for our, this is for our agency over all of these counties. So this is Hill, Liberty, Tool, Ponderay, um, Glacier, all averaged together into one big bucket here, right? It didn't pay in 2020 much, but that was a good year for the whole state, basically. Then in 21, we hit a substantial drought in most of our area here. And it also happened to coincide with when they released ECO as well. So a lot of you guys got into SEO and ECO both there, plus the commodity prices nearly doubled on some of that. So there was $700,000 in premium in 21 through our agency here and $7.1 million paid out. So 10 times what has been paid in. Uh, in 22, similar situation where we had $1.8 million paid in. 22 is dry pretty much everywhere except Northern Tool County. And it paid out almost $7 million again in 22 because of the extreme droughts. So if you're a guy that's been in this program from the beginning, you probably are at 20 times what you would have paid in or more in premium in this program that's paid back out. It's been a substantial help in these bad years. So this is for our agency as a whole. Sorry, I think my picture is blocking this on this slide, but we paid out $13 million or about 20 times what was paid into this program because of the volatile markets and the droughts. If you're in accounting where it, it hasn't paid as well, which I ran scenarios on every crop in pretty much every county in Toole County, um, I don't know an irrigated that it makes sense to be an SEO. ECO would make sense to me because of the smaller trigger level, but on dry land, every county in Montana pretty much has paid back more in this program than you would pay in it. If you're in a county where it's just break even or maybe it hadn't paid back enough to make it worth it, that means your yields have been ratcheting up every year and it makes it even more likely in those counties that you're going to get payments going forward. So please take a look at this program. It can make the difference between you breaking even and coming out ahead or not losing money, basically. Now, this just shows up per acre what we averaged over our whole, our whole agency on this because it's hard to wrap your mind around the millions of dollars end of things, but the difference it can make per acre. So on average, our customers paid in $7 an acre into ECO last year and got $23 an acre back. So you end up netting 15 bucks an acre. doesn't seem like a lot, but average farm size through us now is probably two to 3,000 acres. That's a $50,000 check there, right? Um, on SEO, the premium was less than that. It happened to trigger SEO and ECO last year. So we only paid in $449 an acre and got $24 an acre back on average. So if you were in both those programs last year, $12 an acre in premium paid in and $48 payback. So you're you're netting out $36 an acre. That $36 an acre, from what I can see anyways on our own farm, is the difference between losing money in some of these years and actually turning a net profit. Because if you're cutting right down to where your crop insurance level is on your individual side, that almost always is never much above break even or usually is a financial loss in equity for that year. So strongly consider looking at these programs. They're, it's expensive, but it's not any more expensive than doing optional units in your farm. So if you put everything into enterprise units and you roll these two programs into there in a really bad year, you end up with a lot more loss payment for the same amount of premium. Uh, this is just showing the SEO county yields. What is going to be the crutch of this program in Tool County if we keep having bad drought years is eventually our yields are going to ratchet down to the point that maybe this won't be worth it. But for now, you can see we're looking from 2020 all the way through 2023. We were at 38 bushels in 2020. We've had some pretty bad droughts through that, and we've gone down to 36 now. So we've lost two bushels off the top on the county. Um, it hasn't fallen as much as you would expect. So obviously this is averaged over more than just like a five-year stretch. I, I can't seem to find anywhere where it, it really tells me how these averages are, are figured, but it's obviously buffered quite a bit for bad years in there, which is good. So 
as long as our county stays up in the mid to high 30 bushel range, that to me is a, a level where it's definitely worth being in this. If it, Tool County falls down to 30 bushels an acre, then hey, we, maybe we want to look at not paying the premium for this program. But um, you can look at the next slide. The next thing on this slide shows us Liberty County, similar drought scenarios, but it took them longer to adjust the yields for some reason in there. So you stayed at 44 bushels an acre for wheat in Liberty County for three years through even some pretty bad droughts. Lost three bushels in this last crop year, so you're down to 41, but still pretty darn high yields for that county. Then, like my previous discussion, if you're in Ponderé County and your yields keep ratcheting up because you keep having good years like it shows here. So we went from 45 bushels in 2020 up to 48.6 in uh, 23 now that we're working off of. The higher those numbers ratchet, if you're in a county that's been lucky enough to actually have decent crops in the last five to 10 years, your odds of getting paid on this are extremely high. And if you were thinking that you're just an exception and there's not gonna be droughts in your county anymore, that obviously is not the case. We're in a semi-arid environment. Look what happened even last year in 2020. We're now in a D2 or D3 drought in most of these counties again. If you are in any county up here where rainfall is not as predictable, I would strongly consider looking at these programs because it's gonna make a big difference in your payout in the end. Um, this is the premium differences. So the one slide shows optional units. So the higher bar amount is optional units with SCO and ECO stacked on top of itself. The other one is enterprise units um, with the same scenario. As you can see, just the optional unit premium at the 75% is as much or close to as much as taking enterprise units and stacking ECO and SEO on top, and you actually end up picking up a huge amount more in guarantee. So you go from $191 an acre in guarantee up to $242 by adding SEO and ECO for the same premium, but by stacking enterprise units in those two programs together. Now, is there times when you would have been better being an optional unit? Sure, this year is an example of that, where highly erratic rainfall from one part of the farm might be doing 30 and the other part might have been doing 15. In my mind, if your whole farm has done well enough that you're not triggered below your guarantee levels, I would rather take the savings on the enterprise units and bank that over years. And then when we hit some bad years where the county is poor or the market tanks, that will trigger ECO, SEO, and the underlying stuff and you get paid 20% more total on your crop insurance. So. That's just how we look at it. It sure has seemed to work well for our customers. I'm not saying that everything we're saying here is uh, the best way to go about it, but in my mind it is, and it, it seems to have worked out that way. So just quick example on our farm. We're just gonna assume that just the barley pays on ECO and SEO on our stuff. We're pretty sure barley's gonna pay in Tool County because the yields are depressed and the price declined so much. The other part of our farm, the purple you see on this map, which this is the same schedule you would get from NAU from us, your front page will look like this. We had a little bit of peas, like maybe 150 acres of peas. They may not likely pay out because the pulse crop yields are pretty good. Flax, canola, um, specialty crops like mustard, those are all figured over multiple counties, and so they're a lot harder to predict. So you need to know that right up front if you sign up for ECO and SEO and something like flax. There's so few acres of flax that they actually average the whole state together for that. Now that can work out in your benefit if it was wet in your county, but not in the rest of the state. Or in our scenario, it was really dry here, better in the rest of the state. There's a lot of flax up here in the drought area, I think. So I think it's gonna drag it down enough to pay, but it's harder to predict. So for now, we're gonna say the flax didn't pay on our farm or won't for next year, but the barley will. So. We paid premium on about 4,000 acres of crop. Only 2,000 is gonna pay out in this program probably, but that 2,000 acres still will pay out $91,000 in SCO and ECO, and our total premium for the farm for both of those programs is only 31,000. So even with half of the farm only paying, um, we had a pretty bad drought this year. Part of the county wasn't droughty, part was. That's where the pulse crop thing is a little more murky to see if it's gonna pay. But regardless, we're still getting three times back the premium that we paid into this program. Now, I hope someday we actually roll forward here and have to pay all the premium, because that means we probably had a pretty good crop and the county had a good crop.
But for now, since we've been in kind of a disaster loop and the markets have been declining, these programs have paid really well. So if you want to know how much roughly your potential SCO and ECO payout is, if you go to the back page of the schedule, which in our scenario here, the schedule is that thing that has a map on the front that you just saw. On the back, there's these lines. You're going to see here what I have highlighted. There's barley and it says RP next to it. That's your individual coverage. So if your farm got zeroed out, that's the money you'd get. Then the SEO and ECO lines are below that. Just go to the premium liability column and look down it. You'll add the SEO and ECO together and that's what your potential payout is for that program for that crop. Um, the only time it would be different is if the price had increased. Your schedule will show the base price here for these guarantees. If the price would have doubled, let's say, then all of these numbers would double. They'll never go below where they start at because we the base price, the harvest price will never drag down the base price or your guarantee, basically. If you look down this sheet, it also shows our peas and our flax, which I was figuring not paying, but potentially could. So there's potential for even higher payouts down here, obviously. The other thing on the back page of your schedule is you can see your premium. So if you go to the insured premium column, you can go down there and look and that'll show you what your premium is for this um, policy here. So important notes on disaster programs. You must be in PLC, not ARC, if you want to be in this SCO portion of the crop insurance program. Um, I always suggest if you're going to be in one or the other, you should probably start with SCO because it's subsidized higher and the premium is less and it does pay when things go substantially wrong in the county. ECO is more money. It's not subsidized as high, but it's more likely to pay because it triggers at 95%, right? The other thing is if for some reason you want to be an ARC, which I would not suggest at the moment anyways, if you want to be an ARC at the FSA, you can be an ECO and ARC together. There's no FSA linkage requirement, but you can't be an SCO and ARC. SCO and ECO don't pay out till April of the following year. So that's one other little quirk with those programs, you're always going to have to pay the premium up front and then wait for the loss payment where your underlying crop insurance is different that way, right? Um, our county is the least likely program to pay of all the FSA options right now, and I'll show you why that is, and it has to do with how they do the Olympic average of the price. The farm bill set to renew this year, but it's, uh, any, it's unlikely to happen before the election, in my opinion anyways. Technically, it expires here this fall, they're already having problems even keeping the government open. And then when we get to an election year, there's a lot of pressure to not pass this bill till they see how the balance of power settles out oftentimes. Since we have kind of split power now in Congress, it's going to be hard to pass this bill till we actually get past an election. So it's very possible to extend this farm bill. We'll be working off the same set of rules until probably 2025, 20, um, somewhere in that ballpark, I would think. So... ERP payments for 22. If you guys remember, you got paid for ERP for the 21 crop year, actually earlier than this, I think. So you would, it would have been paid somewhere in July, August time frame. For whatever reason, this program has been delayed. Part of that is that they kept extending the deadlines for the 21 ERP payments. Um, but the last news article I said that by mid-October, they should be printing apps for the 22 crop year to issue you guys ERP payments for that disaster of a year. So how this worked in the previous program is it pre-filled with all of your crop insurance loss information. It automatically triggered an app, which you could review. You sign the app and then you're paid within a couple of weeks. So let's, so let's hope this works that streamlined again. Regardless, it looks like mid-October when we'll actually have a pretty good feel for how this is gonna shake out. If you were an ERP, I mean SEO, and ECO last year, so you got all those payments. How it worked in the previous program is they basically paid back all your premium for your crop insurance or 75% of it. That's how I would expect that this would pay again. If you weren't in those programs, this kind of works like an ECO, SEO, except it only pays 75% of it out. And so you might have a pretty good size payment coming if you weren't in the crop insurance disaster programs. Many Highline counties have been in drought long enough to qualify now for 23 as well. So it's possible for this last crop year, you very well might get one of these ERP payments if they pass the funding for it. And that wouldn't happen until 24, right? These are always delayed a year. So what's coming now that you guys may have kind of forgot about is the payment for 22. 
which could be a substantial amount of money for a lot of you guys. So let's hope there's enough funding there to pay a decent percentage of this out. And if there is, that looks like it should come mid-October. So maybe you figure on the payment coming in November. Let's hope. Um, this is just real quick. What's wrong with ARC? It works off of a five-year Olympic average, throwing out the high and the low wheat prices to come up with your base price for this program. So right now you're stuck at 550 a bushel because wheat was so bad for these reference years prior to the, to the last two years that even throwing out the high of seven bucks and the low of five bucks, that left five, three five fifties in there for the average. Now, this year you'll be able to plug in one of those good wheat years in there. So we'll probably be more like 570 or something for the average, but it's still so low that it makes ARC incredibly unlikely to pay. If you're an ARC, you can't be an SEO. And the problem with that is ARC only pays on your base acres, not on your seeded acres, and only 86% of that. So when we look at all these factors, somebody might have a different opinion on this than me, but I don't know how you would come to this conclusion. I would stay away from ARC, put your money into SEO. SEO is not very much money. It pays on all your base acres and it uses the proper revenue prices. Is there a scenario where ARC might go up enough that it's worth it in the future? Sure there is, but we're not there now, right? So as far as PLC payments, there won't be any of those for this last crop year either because the commodity prices are still too high. But we are quickly approaching a scenario where the national cash settlement wheat price could end up falling below 550 a bushel if the futures keeps rolling this way. Um, remember, this is based off of cash sales of wheat through the NAS data. In the Midwest, if our wheat price is seven bucks here, it's very possible they're getting six or less there for the actual cash prices because of the quality of the wheat and the distance to ship it. So um, if we keep rolling backwards on the futures market, PLC very well could get to the point where it could start to trigger again, and then you'd be happy you were in PLC and SCO that could be stacked together at that point. Uh, once again, that ERC, ERP program, you should be receiving apps for ASAP. It only triggers in years when we're in D2 or greater drop for eight consecutive weeks or D3 or greater for the calendar year. Most of you guys for 22 should qualify for that because it was droughty everywhere. So that's good news. It's another reason why it's so important to get the county to fall into D3. If your county is really dry and you're not seeing that happen on this drought report, it's really important you guys submit those drought reports so that they have data to review that that's helped our FSA person, this Laura in Tool County has done a really good job of pushing growers to do that. And I've noticed it's made a big difference in how responsive they are there. So um, your S ECO and SEO payments, what are the predictions for that for this previous, this 2023 crop year? I think if you're in any county that you can see is slightly below average or less, it's very good chance it's gonna pay on those crops that are below average because of the revenue drops, right? So um, wheat's likely to pay in drought counties when combined with slightly lower yields and 10% or farther lower harvest prices. So ECO is pretty much a lock in counties if you were below average because of the drop in the revenue. SEO quite likely like in Toole County where I think we're gonna probably come in closer to 30 bushel average on wheat for the whole county where our, our average yields 36. When you throw another 10 or 15% revenue drop on top of that, it's quite likely that ECO and SEO will, will pay in Toole County. Um, Liberty County, a little tougher to guess, but there was some bad, really bad and some decent crops there. So I'd say ECO pretty likely there, maybe not SEO, but who knows. And then the barley dropped so much on revenue and there wasn't bumper barley crops around here at least that I think barley's quite likely to pay. Now, like I said, there's other crops like uh, canola that combines three counties together. Um, mustard would be a similar situation or flax. Those are harder to predict. So the mustard, it didn't appear to me even in the counties where it looked really good, it was still only running like seven to 10 bushels an acre. So I think Probably pretty likely on that crop too, but we'll have to wait and see there. But for budgeting reasons now, I'd figure the wheat and the barley paying if you were in a droughty county. If you weren't in a droughty county, it's possible ERP, or I mean ECO, though shallow loss one will end up paying just because of the revenue drop if you had just an average crop in the county. If you're in a county with bumper yields, then it probably isn't going to pay. But 
you probably had a pretty good crop too. So the pulses, possibly ECO, but most likely not SEO on most pulse crops. That's because the revenue prices went up on at least the chickpeas and the lentils, it appears, or they will go up. We'll know that in December. Possibly yellow and green peas might have a revenue price drop, and if that happens, they might pay. But in general, the pulse crops, at least in our county, they did pretty good for the drought that we were in because they matured early enough before the rest of the crops got hurt. So I wouldn't figure on the pulse crops paying right now, but it's possible. Mustard flax and other specialty crops, like we said, some of those use combined multi-county yields and those are harder to predict. If you have a quote sheet sitting in front of you that we mailed you, you can look at this quote sheet and you can add up your ECO, SCO, and RP lines and that'll give you your total premium and then your total guarantees and that's what you can use for your quote. So most important slide of the day, must use full legal signatures and all documents. In our example, let's say we're KW Ag, I'm a member of that. I can't just sign a Corey Falk member. I need to sign KWA Egg LLC by Corey Falk member, right? They're getting really sticky on that part. Don't wait to turn in a claim if you think you have one. There is no disadvantage to turning in a claim. I would turn it in, and then if you don't have a loss, you can sign in just one piece of paper and not have to do any of the work and release it. We can't turn in blanket claims over our whole agency. Um, that That's just against the rules. So. If you think there's any chance you have a claim, you're way better off turning it in. We can even get the adjuster out there to take samples, send it off to the state. All of those steps we could take if you want. And if any point in that process you want to release it, we can, we can release it or you can finish it up. But if you don't turn a claim in in time and we get past 15 days from the time you harvested that crop or the end of the insurance period, then it's very possible you could end up in a scenario where we can't pay the claim out. So. Turn in claims. Even if you're just sitting here thinking, oh, I'm busy and I've seen winter wheat and I don't know if I have a claim, turn it in and we can sign off on it later. Uh, don't let the adjusters throw all your production together if you have kept records separate um, for each unit. So for you guys that are in enterprise units, we still give you stuff to keep truckload records to keep it separate as though it's in optional units. That's really important for keeping the yields tied to the land that's better versus the worst stuff. Uh, it's also important if you ever want to go back to optional units. So take the time to split it down to the unit level. If your adjuster suggests so it'll be faster, let's just prorate this over the whole farm. Don't let them do that. Take the time and split it out, if you would, um, to unit by unit basis. So strongly consider ECO and SEO with our current market conditions and drought conditions. We are in such a volatile situation and in, in markets and in weather anymore that being in every one of these programs that trigger on shallow losses to me is just going to make sense for the foreseeable future unless they price us out of it or something so for now because the rates are pretty good on these programs i would get into eco and seo and just stay in there i'm very confident it'll pay back more money than you pay into it anyways never take yp versus rp on a crop unless there's some very solid reasons for that decision if you look at the stuff you just got from your insurance agent and it says yp anywhere on there I would go in and say, hey, what, what's the deal with this? Do you have a reason for this? And really, the only reason through us that would ever happen is possibly on some organic stuff, you'd start with a higher price if you were in YP. Or if you wanted to insure something like waxy barley and use a contract. Those are really the only couple of scenarios where we would ever have you in YP. So if you look on your insurance information right now and you see YP, I would question that. And then enterprise units by type makes putting wheat into enterprise units much more appealing. If you're in optional units right now, the premium difference is so substantial that I would really look at switching it to ET and then to keep your winter, winter, winter and spring wheat separate. Now, the one thing we can't do is enterprise units by type and keep the irrigated and dry land separate at the same time. So that might be one scenario where you would rather have the irrigated and dry land in separate units if you're a guy like that you won't want to be an ET. You might be fine with everything being thrown together, but keeping the dry land and, and uh, the other stuff separate. So we're almost done here. Always elect PLC at the FSA. Neither program's likely to pay till we get farther market drops, but PLC is the most likely, I think, in the moment, and it allows you to be an SCO. If you're watching this, we're probably going to be calling you if you weren't at our meeting to go through your checklist. 
just make sure we go through and we answer, take the time to think about every one of these questions when we ask you this stuff. And we especially need to know if you're doing something like new breaking, you're taking on new land, um, that kind of stuff we don't want to miss because if we miss it and we get past this deadline, we might not be able to get it insurable, right? So thank you guys so much for taking the time to sit through all of this. I know that's uh, an hour of time that you'd probably rather be doing something else, but it's really important to stay current on this. And like I said, if you're not one of our customers and you'd, you'd like to come sit down with us and go through any of this further, we'd be glad to do that. If you are one of our customers, you know that I am always more than willing to meet you in either Sunburst or Shelby and walk through your stuff. And um, just thanks for taking the time. I hope you have a great harvest and great winter wheat seeding and that we start getting some rain here. And we'll update you next spring. Thanks again, guys. Bye.